All right, I confess I have a fear of the unknown. Um, the first time I, uh, I was going to take a bus in the city of Brooklyn, New York, I was scared to death. I was so nervous that my roommate offered to give me money to take a taxi. The crazy thing was that I had never taken a taxi before either, and that scared me. So I ended up taking the bus and survived, as you can see. My point is this. The fear of the unknown affects me in many ways. My agitation goes up, I'm tense, I'm uptight, and the stress comes out in being short with those around me. So when I was pregnant for the first time, I had a lot of anxiety about labor. Now, it, it probably didn't help that my morning sickness lasted all day instead of just the morning for the first three or four months. And it seemed that I couldn't keep anything down. The middle months were, were fine, but my final month, my blood pressure went up. You know, intellectually, I knew that women have given birth for thousands of years, and most women survive the process. However, I was still scared. We took the Lamaze class. We watched the films. Phil was going to be part of the process. We did uh, the exercises. We learned to breathe. He was going to help me, but I was still scared. So it was on the morning of May 22, 1989, 84, thank you. That was 89 was Anthony. See, I even got that wrong. Okay, 84, that I woke with cramping in my lower back. It wasn't much, just, just a twinge. Every now and then, I, I had a full schedule that day. At noon, I was going to take Gwen and her two little girls out to eat. To make matters worse, one of the girls was sick and vomited before we finished lunch. I took her home, and then later on I picked up another gal with whom I was having Bible studies. She had just had a baby girl several months earlier. And I took her to my house, and, and in the middle of the Bible study, my water broke. And the birth pains began in earnest. Needless to say, the Bible study ended. Phil took me to the hospital. Now the labor pains picked up in intensity and I tried breathing like I had been taught in the classes. But then I hyperventilated. And after that, I just plain quit cooperating. In fact, I became downright unreasonable. And Phil will verify that with anyone and everyone. I told Phil I wanted him to leave and I never wanted to see him again. <laughs> now he was in labor pain. His wife had just rejected him. She didn't want to see him. And he left the hospital and he drove home visibly upset and crying. But he came back after a, a long break, and he attempted to be with me again. Now, during this process, the doctor called to see how I was doing, and the nurse told her that it was going to be a while. So my doctor told the nurse she was going to take her dog for a walk. Five minutes later, I was ready to deliver. They paged the doctor, but she was out walking her dog, and so it took her another 30 minutes to get to the hospital. And they had me pant and wait. I was so exhausted by this time that I would sleep between contractions and wake up in the middle of the intensity of the contraction. 
The doctor said she drove 90 miles an hour to get to the hospital. And when she walked in, she took one look at me and she said, what have you given her? They said, she's been like this the whole time. You see, I was so stressed out about childbirth, the fear of the unknown, that I had broken out with hives all over my body. I was stressed. But soon Elizabeth was born, and the stress started easing. I had survived. Labor pain. They say that if men experienced labor pain, there would only be one child per family. <laughs> so why talk about labor pain? This is the Christmas season. It's all about Christ's birth. The angels, the shepherds, the magi, the gifts. Mary and Joseph in the stable. Exactly. Jesus' birth. For a minute, I want you to imagine the glory of heaven. Thousands times ten thousands of angels. Peace, tranquility, perfect worship. Celestial choirs. Oh, today was wonderful, Jerry. Gave us a little foretaste of heaven. But there, in this perfect, wonderful environment, there was only one Mar, and that was this remote part of the universe where there was a planet in rebellion. Only one place where sin marred the face of perfection. In the book Desire of Ages, page 410, this is written, Even before he, Jesus, took humanity upon himself, he saw the whole length of the path he must travel, in order to save that which was lost. Every pang that rent his heart, every insult that was heaped upon his head, every privation he was called to endure was open to his view before he laid aside his crown and royal robe and stepped down from the throne to clothe with divinity, with humanity. The path from the manger to Calvary was all before his eyes. He knew the anguish that would come up on him. He knew, knew it all. And he said, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Ever before him, he saw the result of his mission. His earthly life, so full of toil and self-sacrifice, was cheered by the prospect that he would not have all this travail for naught. By giving his life for the life of men, he would win back the world with, to its loyalty to God. Although the baptism of blood must first be received, although the sins of the world were to weigh upon his innocent soul, although the shadow of unspeakable woe was upon him, yet for the joy that was set before him, he chose to endure the cross and despise the shame. Do we even have grasp a fraction of the labor pain that Jesus underwent, leaving the splendors of, he of heaven and the love of heaven to come and be born, not in a state-of-the-art hospital with its modern birthing rooms, but in a stinky, smelly stable, born to humble peasants. Do we understand the t ties of God the Father and Jesus in their unity and love for one another, who were torn asunder as Jesus embraced humanity forever to rescue fallen man? 
What was that last embrace like before Jesus consented to be implanted as a helpless infant in a planet gone awry? What was it like for Mary, who found herself pregnant before she was married, and had the townspeople whisper questions about her indiscretions? Yeah, right. An angel told you that you would have the Messiah? Can you imagine the weary journey nine months into the pregnancy on a donkey? Why now? Why did the decree have to happen now at this time? Why not after the birth when it would have been easier to travel? Can you imagine the frustration? No room at the end? Joseph, the pain is intensifying. I need to find a place to deliver. The baby's not going to wait much longer. A stable? Is that the best you could do? Pain is mentioned about 60 times in the Bible. And of those 60 times, 15 of the references refer to labor pain. In the beginning, God told Eve, after sin, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. What a legacy for sin, pain, in childbearing. The next story about pain in childbirth is about priest Eli's daughter-in-law. You remember the story, the sons took the ark into battle against the Philistines, thinking to force God's hand in winning the battle for them. The ark is captured, Hophni and Phinehas die, news comes back. Eli's sitting by the side gate waiting to hear the news. And when he hears that the ark is captured and his two sons are dead, he falls backwards off the seat and he breaks his neck and dies. The stress of her husband, had her brother-in-law's death and her father-in-law's death, Phineas' wife goes into labor. As she gives birth, the midwives tell her, don't be afraid, you've born a son. And she doesn't answer or pay any attention to this child. And then she utters the words, Ichabod, the glory has departed from Israel. It's a motif of the world gone awry. Later, the prophet Isaiah and Jeremiah and, all, and Hosea all speak of the co captivity of Israel and Babylon, Lebanon, Ephraim, all being in labor pain with all the horrendous troubles of war, starvation, fighting and dying. Listen to these words from Isaiah. Isaiah 12, 6 through 11. Wail, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will be limp. Every man's heart will melt, and they will be afraid. Pangs and sorrows will take hold of them. They will be in pain as a woman in childbirth. They will be amazed at one another. Their faces will be like flames. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened, it is going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Sounds bad, doesn't it? When we were in Jerusalem, we went to several mu museums that commemorated the times that Jerusalem faced destruction. The sights and the tales were horrific. I can imagine the pain of those families and the horrible destruction. Never faced that in my life. That was in Jerusalem. But others have experienced the pain and the violence of war. The New Testament writers equate the fate of ancient Babylon with the same fate as spiritual Babylon. 
There is a day of reckoning coming. Those who have chosen to live a life of sin apart from Jesus Christ will receive their reward. Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2-6, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Paul makes it clear, yes, there is going to be horrendous pains, as if in labor, but you do not need to fear or be surprised by it. You are children of light and day. You know how it's going to end. You know the Savior. You can have confidence that he will save you. In fact, Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans 5, to 25. He says, For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, eagerly wait for the adoption, the redemption of our body, for we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope, for why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for that what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Throughout the centuries, horrendous atrocities have been done in the name of God and religion. The Crusades begin in 1095 as a holy war against Muslims. Is it any wonder that they're fighting with us now? Later on, there were crusades against those who didn't believe the same as the established church. Later, during the Holocaust, nearly six million Jews were massacred. In my lifetime, there was the ongoing Vietnam War killing between one to three million people. The genocide between the Hutus and the Tutsis killing an estimated half a million to a million. 9-11, recent massacres of unprecedented scale here in the United States and in France and abroad. The pain for families is real. And those of us who are on the sidelines watching the vicarious labor pains are real. The reality of life on earth as we know it, filled with pain, the pain of death, the pain of losing a job, the pain of divorce, the pain of disappointing relationships, the pain of abuse, the pain of natural disasters and unnatural disasters. Somehow in our Pollyanna world, we want to be pain-free. We want it to be all warm and fuzzy. Everyone to get along and, and like each other. Is it any wonder that the Apostle Peter wrote, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials which is to try you. And so some strange thing happened. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering. That when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. Yet if anyone suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Pain is part of living on this planet. Some of it we bring on our own selves. 
Other pain could be due to being a Christian and living for Jesus. But we are not to be shocked by trials. We know that Satan is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. There's another pain that comes. It's the pain of dying to self. It's not easy to surrender everything. So often like the rich young ruler, we want to hang on to what we have. Yet as Christians, we need to die before we can live. Dying to self is an ongoing process. We naturally seek our own way. What's good for us, what we perceive is the way things should be. But the labor pain of surrender is the admission, I give up. I can no longer fight this battle. It's the labor of rebirth. It's accepting that God gives us eternal life. Jesus said in John chapter 16, 20 to 22, Most assuredly, I say to you, that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice, and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. A woman, when she's in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she's given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Therefore, now you have sorrow. But I will see you again. And no one will take from you. Labor pain, the temporary pain of childbirth. Mary bore the pain to give birth to Jesus. Jesus took the pain of humanity for the joy of redeeming us. We live in a pain-filled world. We labor in surrendering self. The contractions are coming faster and stronger. The pain intensifies. The child is about to be born. But we are the children of day, the children of light. It is not surprising to us when we encounter pain trials because Jesus, our pain bearer, we have hope and nothing. Nothing will take the joy away from us when we leave the groanings of this world behind, when Jesus comes to take us home. Labor pain? Yes. It's tough, but we have this hope. We will see our Savior face to face and worship our pain bearer so that we might live him, with him forever. That will be joy, pure joy. Let's pray. Father in heaven, there are days where we struggle with the pain of living in this world, with the pain of disappointment and grief. But Father, you have said that we are children of light and day. And there's joy around the corner when we can spend forever with you. Help us to keep our eyes on you. In Jesus' name, amen.